So when we look at the age of revolutions and the different democratic revolutions that we've looked at over the last couple of weeks, one of the things that you know we've been focusing on is these national histories, right? What's going on in France? What's going on in uh, what would become the United States? What is happening in Italy in the Cisalpine Republic and the Ligurian Republic? What's happening in the Belgian states, within the, the low states? Well through all of this right the thing that is sort of going on in the background is changing everyone's lives and that is the industrial revolution the industrial revolution was an event series of events uh, a phenomenon however you want to describe it without that noun that impacts everyone's lives right there's not a single person in the world that is not going to be impacted by this. Where, you know, that could be said, you know, maybe for the French Revolution or the American Revolution. Um, so what is the Industrial Revolution? The Industrial Revolution was a period starting in about 1750 and going on arguably till today where manpower and muscle power were replaced by coal and steam power and mechanical power and the social cultural environmental impacts that come out of that so the industrial revolution was really kicked off spurred by the tinkering of james watt and the development of the steam engine so the steam engine is developed in the late 1600s by a guy named thomas newcomen uh, in the early 1700s he he develops it a little bit more and for about a hundred for about 50 years or so the steam engine is operating uh to to pump water out of coal mines however by the time james watts gets his hands on the uh, steam engine in the 1750s and 60s he changes the way that uh, the steam engine operates and he adds an, an additional compressor unit which helps to more efficiently manage and, and convert the steam power into mechanical arm power which means less coal is needed to um, produce movable power along with that you also have additions to the <clears throat> The textile industry now the textile industry is a really interesting industry um, that emerges here right because one of the things that's important is well one of the things about textiles is everybody needs textiles right everybody can benefit from cheaper clothing and what happens as a result of that is uh you know when textiles become cheaper it takes off right the other part to this is that in britain there were a large number of textile manufacturers right uh, in the countryside there are a lot of sheep uh, there is a lot of trading going on for wool cottons are kind of starting to come into play here so you have the emergence of a large textile industry because through the work uh, of these items the other impact here is that there is massive urbanization and population growth as people are working in the cities and they are being drawn into more uh, urban environments, there was a massive growth in cities, right? So you can see, and this is a little later than what we've been discussing, but right, but like places like Birmingham in the 90 years uh, of, the, of the 1800s, there is an exponential growth of the city. And you can see the same is true for Leeds liverpool um, and and manchester now factories right are drawing people in we want a closer work environment uh people be closer to their work environment and the globally speaking right there's also an increase in population um, and this is again particularly true for a place like britain right where there's greater amounts of um food being produced in the 1700s and again if people can be you know well fed and well nourished they will have the energy to fight off 
minor diseases and minor illnesses, and it helps increase their ability to, to reproduce and obviously you know, better population growth as a result. We will also, you know, I will also point out that, um, you know, this urbanization is drawing less people off the land, right? So as urbanization is increasing at the beginning of the 1700s, 80% of Britain's population is making their money from the land. But by the end of the century, or by the early 18th, uh, 1800s, that, is, that number drops to 40% of the population making their money through the land. So that is a, just, again, once, once more, uh, just a major change that is occurring here. And, and I will also point out here, right, that there is, you know, cities are growing, rural areas becoming less populated, and you can see that here. As people... <clears throat> By the 1800s, as people are moving more and more into the cities, one of the things that is occurring is there are becoming these, uh, these places called rotten boroughs, where cities are growing at huge rates, but places like, you know, rural uh, England, Cornwall, Wales, parts of Scotland are becoming drastically underrepresented. I'm sorry, under, uh, underpopulated. So what's happening here is when, you know, parliament was established and seats were given, they were given proportionally based on rural populations, right? But as the rural populations are being decimated and the urban populations are ballooning, what you don't have happening is a redistribution and a reapportionment of those seats. So by the 1830s, you have cities like Leeds, Manchester, Birmingham, London, Glasgow, Edinburgh in England or Britain, England, Scotland, that are, that are hugely populated, right? But they don't have the same representation. You know, the million or so people that live in London you know, may have, you know, a handful of representatives, but there's like one representative for a rural part of England where there's, you know, a dozen people that live. And those type, and that's not necessarily an exaggeration there, there are a lot uh, of places that look like that. So in the 1830s, there's a movement called Chartism based on the People's Charter. And within the People's Charter, there was a desire to create more equitable distribution. So the People's Charter was, was, as it sounds like, a petition that went around and ultimately gets over a million signatures. And it's a, it's a petition to the government to pass an act that will reduce the requirements on people to vote so that there could be more equitable voting access but also that each district be reapportioned and redistricted so that they are, they are equally represented. And again, this is a way to try and help stabilize elections, help make Britain more representative, and really take into account the new and urbanization and industrialization of the nation. Why is urbanization happening so quickly? Well, one of the things, as I've said, is, is companies, cities, being uh, growing because of factory workers in urban environments. But there's also new railroad, <clears throat> new railroads. And these railroads help connect different parts of the country, right? So if you do live in rural England or Scotland, you can easily get back home or, or you know, going away, going to work away, it wasn't as forever as it may have once been. And that, I think, is helpful to remember here, that there's the growing transportation um, and, you know, as, uh, you know as, as we can discuss, you know, within the United States, you're talking about massive growth of the railroads as well, uh, you know, from low tens of thousands of miles in the 1860s to hundreds of thousands of miles by the 1880s and 90s. There's better communication, right? Telegraph cables follow the railroad uh, so that we can communicate across 
space in place a lot easier and and so on okay so one of the now is that sort of the let's call it environmental let's call it social um, social uh, industrial economic changes that occur there's also cultural changes I guess along with social changes right in terms of literacy one of the big pieces that changes in the late 18th century into the early 19th century again out of industrialization is that there is a massive change in ability to read and write and that's because of people needing to be literate for industrial jobs right as as um, as people are getting jobs in factories, as people are getting jobs and hopeful, hoping to expand, as public education is emerging, right? There is a desire to have more literate population so that they can act in, <clears throat> they can be part of the society. So you can see a massive change in percentages here um, across the board. Uh, in this period and the same would be true here so finally uh, we are going to look at we are going to look at the impact that all of this has on the lives of the people the work the work that people did in this period was extremely dangerous Right. There were no regulations, right? There are no OSHA regulations that helped people sort of survive and not have to work in awful conditions. You know, people worked in very dangerous, very risky places. Machines, uh, you know, in terms of factories and mines, right? The machines were <coughs> uncovered, right? So these big moving wheels were right there for your hands to get caught in. Children were working because there was no age limit at which a person could stop working or start working. There was no disability insurance, right? So if you got injured, there was nothing there to protect you. You know, and this is the same is true for mines, right? There was no protection on any of these things, right? Mines could easily collapse and there was no precautions put in to help that stop. You're dealing with dangerous, dangerous gases, right? The natural gas that gets turned on when you turn on your stove uh, is, is a byproduct of coal production. Uh, so one of the things that, or I should say, is when coal is produced, right, natural, natural gas can also be produced. So one of the things that happens is there's just, you know, explosions underground. People can suffocate from this. It is just awful conditions. And there are just no regulations as they're getting right because the industry – and I don't want to say – I mean maybe it is partly a nefarious reason why there are no regulations. But it's also these industries are growing so quickly that regulations don't catch up that quickly. So here are some more of the dangers. Uh, I mean, I, should, I will also point out, right, that children are working in these environments, and it's obviously extremely dangerous for all of them. Um, you know, they're paid less. Uh, they don't necessarily know the risks that they're doing. Uh, their their hands are smaller, so they're often using smaller. They're use, uh, doing smaller chores, right? Maybe picking. Um, you know, unloosening the clothes or something like that, that that, that could really hurt their fingers and, and, and maim them. So there are needs for reform, right? Again, part of it is nefarious, right? I, th I would say that there is this idea of laissez-faire capitalism. You know, don't put any restrictions on, on these businesses. Let them continue to grow and let them continue to earn. But there's also, obviously, you know, there, there, <clears throat> there are nefarious things, right? Capitalists don't want their money to be curtailed uh, by regulation um, so unions are formed or, or at least put on right there are petitions to try and limit the changes that can happen uh, and eventually laws are put into place to try and prohibit sort of the, some of these poor treatments right so you have a factory act that goes into place in the 1830s then more factory acts that are put in that limit the ages at which children can work uh, there's just a huge number of reforms that go on 
in the 1830s and into the 1840s to try and improve the working conditions. And they're here, right? But I'm not going to ask, uh, you know, then you can sort of pause these and look at them at your own time. So the Industrial Revolution, as I say, is going on behind this, right? And then we could talk about this as really, you know, an economic change, a social change, a cultural change, uh, and an, an environmental change. And all of those ways are, are correct, right? All of those perspectives are absolutely correct. And it's important for us to remember that the Industrial Revolution impacts everyone's life. There's not a single person in the world that has not been impacted by the Industrial Revolution in some form. And it starts here, right? That that impact, right? You know, for the Europeans, for the British, for the French, for whoever, you know, their life working in a factory obviously changed them. Increasing street lights and, and interconnectedness and movement, that is certainly true. But then, you know, people who live in colonies and maybe aren't in a factory, you know, they're producing goods for the industrial societies, right? There's more food that is needed and, thing, and things such as that. 